Morning, Christ community. How are we? Good. Hey, if you got a Bible, go ahead and open with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. There are right now 5,000 plus donut shops in California today, and 90% of them are owned by Cambodians. 90% are owned by Cambodians, and every single one of those can trace their origin all the way back to one man. One man who goes by the name, they call him the Donut King. See, the 1970s Winchell's, a uh, donut shop in California had a monopoly uh, in Southern California. But Dunkin' Donuts was in the Northeast and they were trying to make their way west into California. And in order to hold off Dunkin' Donuts, Winchell's launched a three month training program for teaching individuals how to bake, how to run a business. And then after the end of their training, at the end of their three month process, they would end up giving them a key to let them run one of their donut shops. And a man by the name of Ted Noy, a Cambodian refugee, saw an opportunity and he took it. He came to America in 1975 and within six months of coming to America, he was running his very first donut shop. In less than five years, he owned 25 of them. And within 10 years of being in America, Ted Noy was bringing in over $100,000 a month because of his donut shops. Knowing that he stumbled, realizing that he stumbled upon something that was pretty special and wanting to help other refugees, other Cambodian refugees back home, Ted would eventually become the sponsor for more than a hundred different Cambodian families. He would pay for their airfare to get them to come to America, and then he would uh, house them and find them lodging and take care of all the details for them. And then he would do everything in his power to help them to be able to succeed. So... In these tent cities, words beginning to spread, and they're, they've called this guy now Uncle Ted, and they're, everyone's learning about Uncle Ted and what he'll do to help you get yourself established and get on your feet so that you can begin to, 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 to make it in America. One family was reflecting on, on what it was that, that Ted was doing and, and how he served their family, and they said, when we came to America, we didn't know anything. We didn't know the culture, we didn't know the food, but he would allow us to get close to him so that we could learn quickly. So Ted starts training all of these men. He's equipping them with the skills needed to be able to make donuts and, and run a shop, empowering them to be able to open and run their own stores. And then those whom he has invested in, those whom he has trained up are starting to take what they've learned from Ted and they're now passing it on to, to other families. And so he'd help one family and they'd help another family. And today in California, it is the mom and pop Cambodian donut shops that have run Winchell's out of business and Dunkin' Donuts completely out of the state. The Cambodians have mastered the making of donuts and are multiplying donut shops all over Southern California. In church, if the Cambodians can master the making of donuts, then shouldn't we as Christians be able to master the making of disciples? As Christians, we ought to be the masters of multiplication. But spiritually speaking, right now in this room, how many Uncle Ted's are with us this morning? How many of us are spiritual grandparents in the faith? Who's coming to us to learn everything we know about making disciples? Who are we allowing to get close enough to us so that, they can, so that we can teach them to everything we know about following Jesus and then send them out to go and live and lead their lives for the glory of King Jesus. Where are our disciples who are making disciples? See, the problem is that the majority of Christians in America today are not making disciples, which is a massive problem because, the, because disciple making is the primary purpose for which we exist today as the people of God. But somehow the great commission has become the great omission. And Jesus' last words are supposed to be our first priority, but we have ignored them altogether. Somehow we've substituted the actual great commission for the functional great commission. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And instead of doing that, what are we doing? We're, we're going and we're making more worship attenders and baptizing them in the name of small groups and teaching them to serve maybe once or twice a month. Church, this is not what God has designed us for. This is not what God has saved us for. 
We exist, we've said over and over in the series, for the glory of God. And how do we bring the most glory to God? We, we glorify God as we make, mature, and multiply gospel-centered disciples in our lives, through our lives, to the end of our lives. We make, mature, and multiply gospel-centered disciples, and that is how we will bring the most glory to God. And if this is true, if this is real, if this is how we glorify God, then why are so few of us actually making mature disciples and multiplying our lives through others for the glory of God? Listen, I don't want to assume that I've got all the answers, but I, I, I know that there are some challenges. And it's at least these four challenges of multiplication that I've identified that I think prevent us and get in the way of us being obedient to go and do what it is that God has called us to do. So the first challenge is this. Multiplication is foreign. Multiplication is foreign to so many of us. Like, like, like the reality is when we got saved, when we came to faith in Christ, no one ever really discipled us. No one really took us under the wing and said, hey, I haven't got it all figured out yet, but I'm further along in this journey than you are. And so why don't you come and follow me as I follow Jesus? Why don't you imitate me as I imitate Christ? And I want to teach you how to read your Bible. I want to teach you how to study God's word. I want to teach you how to pray. I want to teach you how to share the gospel. No one ever really discipled us. Multiplication is foreign for us. If someone asked us to disciple them right now, we wouldn't even know where to start for many of us. We would, we, we would be, have about as much success as someone dropped us off in a foreign language class today and told us to go and take the test. We have no idea. Multiplication is foreign for so many of us, but it's also messy. Multiplication is messy. Dr. Jerry White, like 50, 60 years ago, when computers were really starting to, to, to come onto the scene, he was a former instructor at the United States Air Force Academy. Dr. Jerry Wright ran an, an experiment one time on his computer, and, and in his experiment, he was trying to figure out like how, 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 many, how thick a piece of paper would be if he folded it 50 times. And he was using like this really thin like Indian paper, so essentially it was like the, the thickness of, of like a page in your Bible, right? Super thin. He said, if you folded it 50 times, how thick would that piece of paper be? You know what answer the computer gave him? 17 million miles high. You're sitting there, you're going, I don't believe you. But I want you to go home today and just take a, take a piece of, of, of white uh, regular paper that you use in your inner printer, right? And just try to fold it. You'll get like five to seven folds and it's going to be this thick. You, and and what, what that experiment shows us is the power of, of exponential growth. And if you get in the discipleship world long enough, what you, you realize is everyone starts talking about the power of multiplication, the power of exponential growth, and just how significant it is. And if you'll invest your life into four men, and then they go and invest their lives into four men each, eventually, like you could win an entire town in three years. But the problem with that is that multiplication is messy, Right? The power of multiplication through exponential growth is much cleaner on paper or on a computer than it is in real life. Because let me tell you what really happens when you start spending your life investing in men and women for the glory of God. You start investing your life with the intention that they would multiply eventually in like a year or two based off of when you finish your program with them, right? And then what ends up happening? You're getting towards the end of your time with them and you've, you're, you're ready to launch them out. And then what happens? Some man's marriage is starting to fall apart. His marriage is falling apart. And you got another guy who, who falls away from the faith altogether. You've, you've poured out everything you have into the, into the life of another man or another woman, and you've invested in them. And all of a sudden, they just fall away and they disappear. And then you got another guy who, like, you, you really had high hopes for, and you think that he'll get there. And eventually, you're sure that he will, but he's not ready yet to multiply. You thought it would take two years, but it might take three. And so instead of sending him out to go and lead another group of guys, you have to now bring him in and, and he has to watch you uh, lead another group of guys. He gets to participate with it, but he's not ready to go out on his own. Multiplication is messy. It's foreign, it's messy, and it's slow, right? Think about what, what Paul tells the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. He says, and we urge you, brothers. He's talking to them about discipleship. He says, we urge you, brothers, to admonish the idol." Man, there are some people that are just lazy in their walk with Christ. And you need to call them out and call them up. That's what he says. Admonish the idle and encourage the faint-hearted. There are some that are just discouraged. 
And you need to build them up. Some, some people you got to call up and call out. Other people, you just got to build them up. They're just so discouraged in the faith. And he says, others are weak. Help the weak, he says. But then what does he say at the very end of verse 14? Be patient with them all. Right? It doesn't matter who you're discipling. Patience is required in every single discipleship relationship you and I will ever have. Right? We talked about this a little bit last week, that we can't microwave maturity. Discipleship doesn't happen overnight. No, discipleship happens over a variety of settings and seasons. Really and truly, discipleship never actually ends, not until we fully reach the full measure of our maturity, like we talked about last week, which is Jesus Christ himself. So the end of our lives, or, or us going home to be with the Lord, that's the only way in which we reach the full measure of maturity to which we were created for. Discipleship, mature, multiplication is foreign and messy and slow and forth. It is hard. If you've ever tried to make, this, make a disciple, it is hard. And Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Y'all, Jesus had to carry a cross. Why would we be surprised that we would have, have to do, do the same? Why are so few of us unwilling to do the hard things of following after Jesus? Y'all, Jesus had a Judas. And if Jesus had a Judas, Judas, don't be surprised when you have one too. Realize that Jesus invested his blood, sweat, and tears into the lives of 12 men. And in his darkest hour, what do they do? They abandoned him and betrayed him. So don't be surprised when you pour your life into the lives of others for the sake of multiplication, trying to be obedient to what God calls us to do, and when they abandon you and betray you as well. See, if you want to multiply your life in the life of another, it is going to be a sacrifice, and it is going to be painful, and it will more times than not look like failure. We've got to understand that we will never be successful. We will never be successful in our endeavor to make gospel-centered disciples until we come to terms with the reality that our life is not our own. That's the only way, I'm convinced, that's the only way we're going to be willing to, to sacrifice and pay the price and to do the hard work of making a disciple. Multiplication is hard. It will cost you your life. Multiplication is foreign it is slow, it is messy, and it is hard. But nevertheless, I'm convinced that God calls us to multiply our lives through the lives of others, to pour out ourselves in the building up of another, that we would bring another with us, that we bring many with us and the, as we go after Jesus. And in fact, I think 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, I think God gives us a picture of what multiplication can look like. As Paul tells Timothy, his child in the faith, what does he tell him in verse 2? What you, Timothy, have heard from me, Paul, in the presence of many witnesses, I want you to entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Guys, did you see that? In this one verse, there are four generations of disciples, four generations of multiplication. In this one single verse, you've got Paul, Investing in Timothy, his child in the faith. And he, what does he tell him? I want you to go and entrust what I've given to you. And I want you to give it to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. See, Paul is living his life. He realizes that when the gospel came to him, it was headed to somebody else. And it is my prayer that we would be a people at Christ Community Denver who would live our lives to leave a legacy of disciple making behind us. That we would live today in such a way that, that we'd be thinking about the un, like those who have not even yet come to faith in Christ. That we would be so focused in our disciple making efforts and our multiplication of our lives through, through our life into the lives of others, that we would not just be thinking about the one that we're investing in, but we'd be thinking about the future generations of disciples that would come through them. You see, I believe, I believe with like all of my heart that God's vision for our day is a multitude of not like, like educated, degreed pastors, but, but rather like a multitude of ordinary spirit-filled believers turning the world upside down with the power of God inside of us and not because of our talent, but because the spirit of God is in us and that God will be using us for his glory to turn the world upside down. I'm convinced of it, that God's plan, his vision for our day is a multitude of ordinary spirit-filled believers doing the work of God. Do we realize that the 
the spirit inside of us is better than Jesus beside us. Like so many of us would say, I, I don't want, I can't do what they did. I can't be like Peter, James, and John and the rest of the disciples because they had Jesus with them. Do you realize that Jesus told them, it is better that I leave you? For when I leave you, the spirit will come and he will cause you to do greater works than these. The spirit inside of us is better than Jesus beside of us. Do we realize that? Like God wants to use us to, to reach the nations, to reach the world, to bring him glory that all might know. But what's it going to take? Because it is hard. It is foreign and it is slow and it is messy. So what's it going to take? What I want to do with the rest of our time this morning is I want to show you from 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 7, four requirements of multiplication. Four requirements of multiplication from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. If you've got a Bible, read with me. It says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. For no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think, Timothy, over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Lord, it is your word that we turn to now. God, we, th we aim to think in regards to these pictures that Paul has presented for us in regards to their implications for disciple making and multiplication of our lives. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? And would you make us into disciple makers? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Four requirements of multiplication. Number one, the first requirement is that multiplication requires the devotion of a teacher. Multiplication requires the devotion of a teacher. For he says in verse one, you then my child be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, what? And trust, circle that. And trust to faithful men who will be able to what? To teach others also. See, Paul calls Timothy to take the message of the gospel and to entrust it into the lives of those who will be able to teach others as well. Why? Because Paul, Paul wants to ensure that his student is entrusting the gospel message to future generations. Why? Because Paul realizes that, that every generation is asking why. Every generation is trying to figure out what life is all about. And every generation has questions about who they are and who God is and who he's made them to be and how it is that they can have a relationship with him. And Paul understands that this gospel has the power to bring transformation to every generation. And so he says, you don't need gimmicks. You don't need to, to, to a degree. What you need is the gospel. What you need is the gospel. And so entrust to faithful men what it is that you've heard me investing my life into you and in. entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You see, as followers of Jesus Christ, we must be devoted in discipleship in the same way that a teacher is devoted to her students. We must have the same level and same intensity of devotion that a teacher has for her students. But in this effort and with this devotion, God is not asking us to be innovative in our discipleship. God is not asking us to be creative. We don't have to have a Pinterest board to find out the most creative ways to teach others how to follow Jesus. We just got to invite them into our time. God is not in, in asking us to be innovative in our discipleship strategy. God is simply inviting us to get involved. And here's what I believe. I believe that if we will get involved, God will turn our involvement into an investment. That if, if we will simply step out and step into the life of another and, in, and begin to involve ourselves in God's plan for reaching the nations, which is through disciple making, that God will turn our involvement into an investment and it will not return void. I believe that we will find that to the degree that we are devoted to making disciples, we will be empowered to make disciples. That, that if we will have the same degree of devotion 
that we think and we spend every waking moment of our lives thinking about how do we bring glory to God through being obedient to the making of disciples, through the investment of another, through multiplying our lives into the lives of another. I believe that if we will be devoted to it, then we will be empowered to do it. For that is exactly what Paul says. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If you and I, if we will be devoted to making disciples, to the same degree that we have that level of devotion, we will find that we are empowered to do what it is that we are devoted to. God will see to it. Multiplication requires the devotion of a teacher, but it also requires the dedication of a soldier. For Paul says in verse three, share in suffering as a good soldier in Christ Jesus. For no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. What is Paul after? Paul is, is, is seeking to remind Timothy of the commander in chief who enlisted Timothy in the very beginning. Right? He invites Timothy to endure hardship, literally to suffer together with those of us who are, who are all in on making disciples. Would you come? This is a hard work, Timothy. Would you endure hardship? Would you suffer with us in this? Why? Because Paul understands that the work of disciple making, the work of multiplying is a spiritual war, that we are not fighting against flesh and blood. No, eternity is at stake, and the souls of men, women, and children are on the line. And so therefore, Paul is calling Timothy and Paul is calling us to be good, a good soldier of Christ. And you think about a soldier, what is every good soldier? Every good soldier has a single minded focus to follow the orders of the commanding officer. And as Christians, we're to have the same single minded dedication to Jesus Christ, who, as the author of Hebrews says, is the captain of our salvation. And we are right now are being invited to join the ranks of those who have gone before us and who have suffered for the sake of the name that is greater than every other name. But here's the deal, and I believe this, I believe this, that, that as long as we view church as an optional add-on to our already over busy and over-scheduled lives, then we'll never be good soldiers of Christ. That is, if we continue to view church and the gathering of, of this week, this is just part of one of the things that we do sometimes. And if I've got something better or if I'm too busy or too tired, if we begin, continue to, to view church in that light, in that manner, when we already are overscheduled and run ragged, then we will never be a good soldier of Christ. The church is not an audience to be entertained. The church is an army to be empowered. And what we've got to understand is that this is not peace time. This is war time. And if we have the mindset that we are in a spiritual war, then what is that going to bring to us? That's going to bring to us uh, a, a courage and a, and, a, and a conviction and a commitment, right? That's going to bring to us a willingness to sacrifice, to lay down our lives for the sake of the, the greater cause. A good soldier knows better than to get his or her life entangled into civilian pursuits. And so let us be a single-minded disciple who, who avoids anything that gets in the way of or hinders our single-minded dedication to, to our orders to go and make disciples. Let's not get tangled up in merely living. Let's not get tangled up in simply existing. Let's be good soldiers and let's give ourselves fully to the service of the commander in chief who has called us and enlisted us from the very beginning. Multiplication requires the devotion of a teacher, the dedication of a soldier, and third, the discipline of an athlete. For Paul says in verse five, an athlete is not crowned unless what? Unless he competes according to the rules. You see, in, ancient, in their day, in ancient athletes who participated in the Olympiads had to complete a required 10-month training period. And then they had to swear an oath. They had to swear an oath that they, that they did it, that they followed through. Those were the rules to which they had to compete with. And right here, Paul is calling Timothy and us to be disciplined and to be committed with the same sort of, sort of wholehearted intensity to be willing to put in the work that's required to compete and play in the games, to not be afraid of getting a little dirty or a little sweaty, to, to be disciplined enough to show up even when you don't want to. 
that when you're eight months out from what it is that you're really after, that you're still willing to show up and do the work, the hard work to prepare like every day is game day. That's what Paul is calling Timothy to. And I think back to when I was in high school playing football in New Orleans. Y'all, there were no off days. There were no off seasons. Like we'd be in the weight room every morning before school at 6 a.m. It'd be baseball season. I'd be, I'd be at school at 6 a.m. My mom would have to drop me off before I could drive. There were no off days. We would be in the film room studying the film of our opponents, watching their every single move, wanting to know the play they were going to run before they even ran it. We would sit in class memorizing the playbook. We had a discipline and a commitment that, to which we were given ourselves to as athletes. And in the same way, we're to, we're to be just as committed and just as disciplined in our disciple-making efforts today. But too many Christians today want to wear the jersey, but they don't want to get it any dirty. Too many of us want to be in the team photo, but we don't want to put in the work in order to get in the huddle. Too many of us want to wear the letterman without ever contributing anything to our church's success in the making disciples and the pushing back of darkness and advancing on the kingdom of God. Oh, I pray that that would not be said of any of us. I pray that we'd be a people who'd be in the word every single morning, that we would be a people in the word before we do anything else, that we would be a people who, who abide in the word of God, that we would dwell regularly before the Lord and, and experience an intimacy with him, that we would watch the film on the enemy. We would know the plays that he's going to run before he calls a single play, that we would know what it is that he's about to do, that we would listen to the coach, that we would believe that our coach understands the game of life better than we do, and that he has a play and he has a plan. And we just want to believe and go all in trusting that our God is at work and our God has a coach whom we can trust and go after. Multiplication requires the devotion of a teacher, the dedication of a soldier, the discipline of an athlete, and then fourth and finally, multiplication requires the diligence of a farmer. For Paul says in verse 6, it is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. What is Paul after here for Timothy? He, he wants Timothy to understand that, that he has to do the hard work of disciple-making. If he wants to reap the reward. If he wants to see the fruit of his labor. And if you just pause for a moment and think about like, like the similarities of farming and discipleship and how, how the two are so interrelated. It's incredible. Farming and discipleship both require early and long hours, don't they? Every farmer knows that every minute matters. It's why they're up before the sun is. Right? How much more so is that true for us as disciple makers? Because for us, it's not just a crop that's on the line, it's eternity that's on the line. And so we get up before the sun rises and we go to bed late, having spent our day thinking about the lives and the souls of others and how we've invested our days into the, the salvation and the maturation and the multiplication of our lives through the lives of others. Farming and discipleship both require early and long hours, but they also require constant toiling, don't they? Right? Plowing, sowing, tending, weeding, reaping, storing, repeating. The work of a farmer is never done, right? And in much the same way, the work of a disciple maker is never, ever fully finished. We, we too are plowing the ground, preparing for the seeds of the gospel that we're going to scatter. We too are tending to the new fresh roots that are beginning to bear fruit and come to life. We too are weeding and trying to pull out the sin that would seek to ruin. We too are reaping and storing and repeating the process. That our life, our, our, the, the work of our life never really comes to an end. We are filled as disciple makers with, when we think about the multiplication of our lives, we are filled with a constant toiling. Additionally, forming discipleship both require regular disappointments. Regular disappointments. Think about it from a, from a farmer's perspective. Frost and pest and disease, that no matter how hard he or she might work, that, that in the end, ultimately, there could be a little bug that comes in and just eats it all up. And similarly, sin and our disciple-making efforts, sin will creep in and the enemy will show up and seek to ruin and uproot the work that we've invested in the life of another brother or sister. Choke out by the cares of this world, Jesus tells us in one of his parables. There are regular disappointments that come in our disciple-making efforts. And then finally, farming and discipleship both require much patience. 
You ever watched something you've planted try to grow? It's really boring. It's really like you can't see the change happening. Most of it is happening underneath the ground before you even begin to see evidence of it in real life above ground. Everything happens at less than slow motion when you're a farmer and everything happens at less than so slow motion when you're a disciple maker. Plants don't grow overnight and neither do men mature in just one single me meeting. And all the ladies in the room said yes and amen. <laughs> Multiplication requires devotion and dedication Discipline and diligence. Like this is hard work and messy and slow and foreign to many of us. But y'all, let me tell you, this is a work that is worth doing. That is a work that is worth your life investment. Because think about it from the perspective of a teacher. Every good teacher knows that on the other side of their devotion is what? Growth and maturity. That the student is no longer where they were, but they've grown up. And every good soldier knows that the other side of their dedication is what? Victory. Victory in the battle and eventually victory in the war. And every good athlete knows that on the other side of their discipline is the reward of their suffering. That eventually they will be able to hold up the prize, the crown, the championship for which they've been after. And every good farmer knows that on the other side of their diligence is the fruit of their labor. So may we be a people of God who spend our lives, who give our lives for the, for the making of disciples and the maturing of disciples and the multiplying of disciples in our lives and through our lives for the glory of King Jesus. May we be a people who are devoted and dedicated and disciplined and diligent in the making and maturing and the multiplying of disciples for the glory of God, for he's worth it. But one pastor said, our success, and I tend to agree with this pastor, our success as a church will never go beyond the commitment of individual members to make disciples. Preaching to the masses, although it is necessary, will never suffice in the work of preparing leaders for evangelism, nor can occasional prayer meetings and training classes for Christian workers do this job. No, men are God's method. They are God's plan for discipleship. It's not through something, but rather through someone. And the success, listen to me, the success of the church and the next generation will not be found in better programs or better preaching, but in better men and women who are spirit-filled men and women who are taking up Jesus' call to go and make disciples, who are giving their lives, living their lives, spending their lives, laying their lives down if necessary for the sake of obedience to the master, for the commander-in-chief. Dawson Trotman once challenged his generation several decades ago, saying, in every Christian audience, I am sure that there are men and women who have been Christians for 5, 10, and 20 years, but who do not know of one person who is living for Jesus Christ today because of them. Men, let me ask you, where is your man? Women, where is your woman? Where are the little boys and the little girls that we are investing in and raising up and shaping and sharpening for the glory of God? Where are the arrows that we are pulling back on the bowstrings for the glory of God as we launch them into the mission of God? All right, I'm done. Whew, sorry. Y'all, this matters. This matters, and I know that this is this is intimidating work. This is unfamiliar work. I get it. And many of you are going, all right, Chris, I get it, I get it, I get it, but I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. And so if that's you, would you just, there's a little tool that we placed in your chair this morning when you walked in. It's called the three-thirds discipleship guide. Listen, this is a tool that you can use as you sit at the dinner table with your spouse and, and your kids. When you're on lunch break with a friend, to not just have a, a surface level conversation about, about, the, high, about you know, the weather this week or this or that or whatever else. This is something that would allow for you to, to dig in and to, and to excavate what's going on in the heart of the person sitting before you. To dig up and uproot. What are the highs? What are the lows of your week this week? 
What is the best thing that God has done? What is the hardest thing you faced this week? What are you reading in God's word? Who are you praying for and sharing the gospel with? Those two questions right there, those are accountability questions. If they know that question is going to be asked every time, guess what? They're going to start reading their Bible and they're going to start praying for and trying to share the gospel with people. How have you been obedient to Jesus this week? How have you walked by faith and obedience? Those are some heart check type of questions. But then you move over, right, into the, into the headspace. And so not only do you want to look back, but you want to begin to look up and get into their head and get into the mind as we seek to transform not just who we are inwardly, but also like how we think mentally. So you open up a passage of scripture, and maybe you've got a systematic plan. I want them to learn this first and this second and this third and this fourth. Or maybe you're just going, hey, I want to open, the, open up the word of God and we're going to read through a, a book of the Bible and we're going to read a passage of scripture. And you know what? We're just going to ask three questions. When I read this passage of scripture, what does it teach us about who God is? And what does this passage of scripture teach us about, about ourselves, about man? That's the, that's the whole point of the sword. The sword, the tip of the sword points up, the bottom of the sword points to the ground. So man and what? Man or God and man. What do we learn? And then that little space bar in the middle of the sword, right? That's not what it's called, but I'm calling it a space bar. And so you begin to ask yourself that question. Those questions. Is there a sin I need to confess? Is there a promise I need to claim? Is there an attitude I need to change or a command I need to obey or an example I need to follow? Here's the deal. I promise you, if, if you don't have a Bible reading strategy, if you would do simply that, I can guarantee you your life and your quiet time with the Lord would be fruitful. And if you would sit across the table from a brother or sister that you're investing in, you don't have to have all the answers. Like the answers are in the book. Just open the book and ask these questions. I promise you it'll bear fruit. So you look back, you look up, and then you look ahead. How do we engage their hands in the, in the mission of God to which God has saved us for? And you practice and you plan and you pray. Practice some of the things that perhaps you've gone over before. Maybe you've taught them three circles. Maybe you showed it to them. And you want them to get another repetition in. Because, right, we've got to get reps in. Maybe they need to practice sharing their story or practice saying, I'm sorry. Or whatever it may be, just let them practice. You practice too. And you come up and you create a plan. Here's what I'm going to do this week is I seek to walk by faithful obedience to the Lord. And then you pray, you sin, and you commission yourselves out to go and make gospel-centered disciples among all people for the glory of God, wherever it is that he might send us. Guys, it's really not as hard as we make it out to be. I get that it's hard. I get that it's overwhelming, but it's not as hard as we've made it to be. And so what is God doing? What is God doing in your heart right now? Who is it that you need to begin to invest intentionally in? How do you need to invite someone in and begin to invest in their life, involving yourself in it and letting God take your involvement and turn it into an investment? Who is the person? Who are the people? Man, what might it look like if together we really did this? And I just talked about it, but like really spent our lives looking to leave a legacy of disciple making. How might the next generation be different? How might more nations know Jesus is Lord? And what would it look like? What could God do with a godly few. I pray you do it. I pray you do it in your life and mine. That together we be a people who are all in on what really matters. That we might not, that we might not be distracted by the things of this world, by the civilian pursuits of this life, but rather that we be a people who are devoted. A people who are dependent and desperate and disciplined and diligent. Man. How much fruit 
could this congregation bear if we would just be obedient to do the very thing that Jesus has called us to do? Let's pray.